Well, good morning. I hope you're enjoying our cold snap. That means it's not 100 degrees today, which is such an incredible thing. I'm happy for that. Perfect timing for our fun day out at the pavilion. Hope you'll join us for that. This morning as we begin, I want to just give a pastoral word. Um, This week, we saw something happen that is a sea change in America when the Supreme Court reversed a long-standing decision regarding Roe versus Wade. There's a lot of legal stuff. Yeah, I think you can clap for that. Yes. And there's a lot of political and legal and constitutional discussions that are going on. But what what I just want to say today is this. I am rejoicing today that life won over death. I am grateful that the state of Missouri has chosen life. Um, Jesus summarized his agenda in John 10.10, where it says the thief has come has not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus now speaking, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I mean, it's very clear in Scripture that God is on the side of life. Specifically, we read about the fact that God is involved even when life begins in the womb. This is one of my most precious passages I wake up often in the morning and I'm, I say this, God, thank you for thinking me up. It was according to his sovereign goodness that he created me. Is life always easy? No. Does my life include pain and frustration and sadness and difficulty, the death of my loved ones? Yeah, absolutely. But at the end of the day, I rejoice because God thought me up and decided I should be. And when I read Psalm 139, this is what I'm reminded of. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. And skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book they are all written. The days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. How precious are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake... I am still with you. What a beautiful thing. All people are created in the image of God, and therefore we should honor, respect, serve, and love all people. Even in these discussions, I think it's very important for us to remember that we have the power of the tongue, both life and death. And may God give us a conviction for life, and the grace to speak life over those who don't agree with us. That's a very important thing in the discussions that are going on today. But today I think we can celebrate the fact that things have changed and life has prevailed. I wanna, and now I'm going to go into the message on joy. Okay, there we go. The title of the message is this, The Power of Joy. Did you know that joy has one of the greatest powers available in your life? When we think about um, things that are important to us, things that can shape our lives, uh, joy is often overlooked. We often mix joy and happiness together and we feel like that, you know, I'm happy when good things happen to me and we seem to be sort of like the victim of circumstances and because we, we really often forget the difference between happiness and joy. Now, I, I can't always predict whether I'm going to be happy or not. You know, the truth is, when my car breaks down, that does not make me happy. How about you? When I get an unexpected bill, that does not make me happy. There's a lot of things in life that can affect my happiness, but there is another level, 
and that is joy. Joy can exist in the most difficult of circumstances. So we're going to begin with understanding that happiness and joy are not the same, although they overlap and are very similar. Uh, when it comes to the Bible, in the book of Luke, uh, the, the, the idea of rejoicing is mentioned 11 times. The Apostle Paul in Philippians, a very short book, mentions nine times, and the command is, we should rejoice. And so let's just take a quick look at the power of joy in our lives. This is supposed to be Sunday fun day, right? This is going to make you happier. When you understand joy, it actually supersedes happiness. The first thing I want to talk about is the power of joy. There is a very famous verse in Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10, and it ends with this phrase, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Would you repeat that with me? The joy of the Lord is your strength. Let's do it again. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Do you feel like you need more strength? Where do you draw greater strength it is the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, if we take a look at the story of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 8, it's kind of, of, of a very odd story in that um, it's the people of God. They've been in exile. Uh, they have finally begun to come back to their homeland. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah are the prominent writers describing what's going on there. Um, Ezra was more of the preacher uh, Nehemiah was more of the leader builder, it's rebuild the wall. But in Nehemiah chapter 8, what is so interesting is that they call together this amazing moment where the people assemble to worship and hear the word of God. So Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 to 12. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate, and they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So the people gathered together, and this is what they ask. They said, Ezra, will you please bring the book of the law and read it to us? So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly of men and women, and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Then he read, it, read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday, before the men and women and those who could understand, and the ears of, in the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Number one, every preacher's dream is that when you read the Bible, people will have attentive ears. So everybody with your, your phone in hand, this preacher's begging you, Try to dial up the attention. Put the phone down, unless it's the Bible. You, you can only teach if people listen. This was an incredible assembly because they asked to have the word of God read and they, they were attentive. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood which they had made for the purpose, and beside him at his right hand, and it lists all of the leaders that were beside him. Verse five, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, amen, amen, while lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So look, I'm standing up on a platform here. Have you noticed that? Yes, the first platform I read about in, in the scripture for the purpose of preaching comes in Nehemiah. And the idea is, hey, let's get on a platform so our voice can carry, so that the focus is easier, and so that's what he does. It's a great, great plan. Verse 7, and also, Jeshua, Bani, Sarabiah, Jamin, I'm, I'm going to skip it, please forgive me, um, so, so they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. So all of these people that were listed there are kind of like the small group or Sunday school teachers, you know? That this is what the word of God says. Now let's discuss what does that mean? How do we apply this? In verse 9, and Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, 
And the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Whoa. These people heard. They begin to weep because as the word of God was proclaimed, they became aware and conscious of their sins, their failures, their shortcomings, and they began to weep. You know, one of my often prayed prayers for our services comes out of Corinthians where Paul is asking people to do things decently in order. He said, so that when the stranger comes into your assembly and the secrets of their heart surface, they will say, surely God is among them. I love the idea, and I've seen this happen time and time again. You come into a church service, you sit down, you hear the word of God, and, and this isn't a fun word for a lot of people. The conviction of God comes over you. And you realize there are some things that need to be corrected. There are some things I need to confess. There are some things going on in my life that aren't right that I should make a change. And people don't like the idea of conviction, myself included, because with conviction... Sometimes you feel like, well, that means I'm guilty, I'm a bad person. But actually, w when you weep because of conviction, you should really weep with tears of joy because God in heaven has spoken to you because he has a hope and a future for you. He, he doesn't want you to stay in that, in that rut. He doesn't want you to stay in that sense of failure and discouragement. So when, when conviction comes and tears flow, while they may have a little bit of a pinch to them, the, the overall sense is, thank you, God, you have not left me. You're still at work in me. And Nehemiah, but they, but they said, they, they did something that was kind of surprising. Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and the scribe and the Levites taught the people, and they said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept and they heard the, as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared, for this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and send portions and rejoice greatly, because they understood the words that were declared to them. It is a beautiful thing that God has given us his word, and his word can stir us up in a way that no other book can. The Bible is alive and powerful. Proverbs 4.12, I mean, sorry, Hebrews 4.12. You would know the, that I made a mistake. I know most of you. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. And so that's what was going on here in Nehemiah. And these people that were weeping, they interrupted their weeping. And I think the reason that they did was this. Once you fall under the conviction of God and you agree with God and you repent and ask for God to forgive you, you know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to get up with great joy and walk into your future with the help of God and the teaching of God. I think sometimes people get stuck in their mourning and weeping. But the joy of the Lord is your strength. When we come to church, we shouldn't ignore what God has to say. And may the, our prayer should be every Sunday. Speak to me. Is that your prayer? God, if there's something I need to know, let me know. I pray that your word would penetrate my soul and guide me. That's what I need. 
But remember this, the moment you confess and repent, it gets wiped away. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. Isaiah 1, 18, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, it's a big deal. Your sins are like scarlet, that's deep red dye, okay? They shall be as white as snow. They are, though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give them a new heart. You need a new heart? Well, I will give them a new heart and put a new spirit within them. I, I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a, a, a heart of flesh. I'm gonna change your heart. People hear the word of God and respond by repenting and surrendering to God are in a good spot. And then the next step is go and rejoice and share with those who don't have. Let people see that you are living in victory. The joy of the Lord is your strength. God has no intention of holding you captive to your sin. His forgiveness is so powerful that it is necessary for us to celebrate the goodness of God, the forgiveness of God, and the fact that the transformation of God is at work in us. We should not get stuck in conviction. Don't speak condemnation over yourself. You are not defined by your sin. You are forgiven, made new, so rejoice in the Lord because God is gracious and he's good. Rejoice over the goodness and the character of God. You, you don't need to walk around moping. Some people think that if you're truly a spiritual Christian, you're very somber. You don't have to be. It's, this is a story about the mercy of God. Jesus in the New Testament tells a story, not exactly the same, but the same themes kind of show up in this. It's the story of the prodigal son. Do you remember that story? I mean, the prodigal son, he, he, he did a lot of bad things. He was insolent, rebellious, told his father some very hurtful things. I wish you were dead. Give me my inheritance now. Thank you. Now I'm out of here. I don't want to be here in your house. You have all these rules that are arbitrary, and I, I don't want to be a part of that. And then he goes out, squanders everything that he had inherited, and then a famine comes. His friends leave. He's starving to death, eating the food of the pigs he's watching. And then... In verse 18 of Luke 15, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, so this is his speech, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So listen to how he identifies himself and redefines himself. I'm not worthy to be your son. I mean, it, that's over. That's bad news. I'm gonna accept the bad news. I am no longer worthy to be your son. All I'm asking for is make me a hired servant because I'm starving to death and you are better to your servants than, than I'm experiencing. So he got up and he went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. We're going to have a party. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this. My son, the son of mine, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. So they began to celebrate. Do you see the parallels here? Nehemiah 8 is, a, is sort of a, a picture of how God so loves, so forgives you, you confessed, you repented, you surrendered. Good, let's move on down the road. Start the party. The joy of the Lord. Where's the joy? What's the joy? The joy of the Lord is that God will forgive and cleanse. 
don't be walking around with an old label. I know some people, I think that, that they struggle because they have claimed as their identity that they are the bad person, an alcoholic, a drug addict, they're angry or jealous person. They, they actually speak over themselves and they, they hear condemning voices in their head and they join the chorus of the condemnation of the devil when the Bible says in Romans, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. So if you are living in condemnation, you are not listening to the voice of God. In fact, God's ready to move you down the road to a celebration and a party. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is what God does. He's working. I love the mercy of God. Why do I love God? No one believes in me like God does. He forgives, he releases, he transforms, he renews. Wow. I mean, if you're here today, right now, and you're experiencing conviction, and the Holy Spirit is saying, hey, you know what I'm talking about. Don't stay there. Confess, repent, surrender so the party can begin. Because God is not going to discard you. He's going to rescue you and he's going to celebrate it. Psalm 103 talks about in verse 11, for as high for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the, so the Lord pities those who fear him. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Two more points. My countdown clock is not on, so I have no idea where I'm at. Number two is this. Choose joy in your difficult circumstances. Just choose joy. Don't just be a happiness-driven person. You can't avoid whether you're happy or not. I mean, honestly, really. I, like, I'm not happy when my car breaks down. I'm not happy when I get a bill I didn't expect. I, I'm not happy when my basement floods, which is a recent experience. I, I'm not happy. Okay, if I was happy, I'd be weird. Okay. But I don't need to live in happiness. Because happiness happens to me. I need to choose joy. Regardless of my circumstances. Philippians 4.4. 4, it's a command. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Have you ever heard this phrase? When life gives you lemons, make lemonade. That's a corny old statement, but that's a pretty good idea. We are inspired by people who keep their joy in spite of their very bad circumstances. Have you ever heard of Bethany Hamilton? As a young girl, she was a surfer. One day, a shark bit her arm off. It is supposed to be impossible that you can surf with one arm. But guess what? Bethany, Bethany Hamilton decided to accept her situation and she went on to learn to surf again. Her father says this, somehow God gave Bethany an amazing amount of grace in this. 
I am in awe. She never says, why me? Surprisingly, Hamilton doesn't view herself as strong, driven, or courageous. She sees the loss of her arm as her destiny, as a blessing in disguise. Bethany sees it as an opportunity that has been handed to her by God, um, says uh, one of her close family friends. She believes that her arm was taken by the shark so that she would be noticed and that she would help and inspire others. Whoa. Look at how joy has transformed this lady. She, Hamilton says, I might not be here if I hadn't asked for God's help. I look at everything that's happened as a part of God's plan for my life. And she chose joy when sadness was there, not happiness. You know, the Apostle Paul was a man who never gave up on his joy. Philippians 1, 12 to 18. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Where is he writing from? He's in prison. So that it, was, it has become evident to the whole palace guard and all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, God is preached, and in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. Paul did not let circumstances take away his joy. And in this passage also, he did not let people who were hurting him take away his joy. I mean, did you know what he, he just said? Some people preach, and they, they preach to try to hurt me. They, they say bad things about me. They, they say I'm not very good. He says, actually, I don't care. <laughs> That's, I'm, this is Eddie Lyons' paraphrase right here. I don't care. If those people who don't like me and tell me I'm not very good are preaching the gospel, I'm glad they're preaching the gospel. My primary focus is that everyone everywhere will hear the truth of the gospel, no matter who's preaching it and for whatever motive they have. Do you see how impervious he was to the people trying to hurt him? Because he, he didn't get bitter. He wasn't angry. He didn't put them down or discredit their ministries. He blessed them. God's plan is less about happiness and more about greater purpose. Do you think that Jesus felt happy when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was sweating drops of blood that intense moment as he anticipated the cross and his prayer was not, Lord, please rescue me and make me happy. No, no, he, this is what he prayed. Lord, if it's possible for this cup to pass, then I, I'm asking to let it pass. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So if, if, if I have to be in pain and struggling and sweating drops of blood because that accomplishes the purpose for which you're calling me, I'll be okay. Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and they sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Paul's an incredible man. I think that one of the important gauges of where we are spiritually is where is our joy when people don't like us and say things bad about us? Do we lose our joy? Do we become angry and bitter and negative? Do we develop a critical spirit? Or, or do we still have the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace? Okay, and the, the list goes on. I mean, we are commanded to rejoice. I mean, if you're here today and you're going through something very difficult and some people around you don't, don't like you and say bad things about you, well, welcome to the club. I mean, seriously, I, I'm sorry for you. I really am. It's going to happen. Um, it, the command is to rejoice, not to throw yourself a pity party. 
Don't be grumbling and complaining. May the Holy Spirit guide us all to embrace joy in the tough circumstances and when people aren't nice to us. So, joy. Remember that joy is powerful. So I'll, I'll invite you to come out and join us in the pavilion later. I'm not sure what the food is. I heard it was hot dogs, which I'm not supposed to eat. But anyway, um, I'm going to rejoice with whatever is there. You know, it's important for us to get together and rejoice. Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Did you know that God has you? He's going to carry you. He's going to help you. When you word your prayers to him and ask for his help, he's hearing you. Where does our joy come from? It comes from the character of our righteous, holy, all-powerful God who is constantly in work in our lives. Boy, we need him. And yes, he is there. So guess what? We can rejoice. I think that the best way for us to re remember how important it is to rejoice and why we can rejoice is for us to remember that Jesus endured the cross paid the price of our redemption. He died and rose again so that he can give us the hope of the resurrection. If God be for us, who can be against us? And in that, we rejoice. I want to ask you to get the communion elements that you were given as you came in. And we're going to take communion. I want to encourage you just even in this moment to just kind of pause in the presence of God. Because this is an important thing. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So if you'll take the, the bread out of, let's pray and thank him for it. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you love us so much that you are willing to let your body be broken so that you could complete the sacrifice necessary for our redemption. So we remember your love, your pain, your sacrifice. Let's eat together. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. It's a covenant signed in the blood of Jesus. It is a blood established covenant. So you know what? He's going to forgive those who come. He's going to bring us into his eternity and give us eternal life. He promised, and he sealed it by shedding his blood on the cross. 
Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice, for the shedding of blood. You fulfilled all that was necessary for us to be saved. And this is a covenant. It's not just a promise. This is a covenant at the highest level. Thank you for this. And in this we rest. We pray this in your name. Amen. Let's drink together. This passage concludes this. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. We just did that. Would you stand, please?